beauty will save the world. Now, I didn't come up with this. <laughs> if you guys know, have you guys heard of Fyodor Dostoevsky? Have you guys, any philosophy majors? Or, so he's a very famous Russian novelist. If you took a, word, a world lit class or anything like that, you would have heard about many of his books. He wrote Crime and Punishment, The Brothers Karamazov, all these amazing revolutionary books. He was a Russian Orthodox Christian, so he put a lot of his faith in his books. And this quote is actually from one of his books called The Idiot. And it's very ironically titled because the main character is a fool in Christ. In the world, he was seen as an idiot, but you could see how he, he was just inspired by just the beauty of Christ. And what, what foolishness looks like to the world is actually wisdom in God's eyes, right? And this was a famous, this was a quote that was attributed to him over and over and over again throughout the book, beauty will save the world. And so the, my first time hearing it, I, what came to me is like, okay, what kind of sentimental, like inspirational quote, like Deepak Chopra kind of stuff, <laughs> you know, it's like, what does this mean? When did beauty ever do anything for anyone? You know, what is beauty, right? And the more I read into it and the more I studied about it, the more it just completely changed my outlook. Let me ask you guys this. Have you guys ever heard a talk on beauty? Not, probably not, right? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Beauty is a very, very, very mysterious thing. In one end, it's sort of neglected as some superficial romanticism, aesthetics, you know, beauty's an eye of the beholder, there's bias to it, so why talk about it? Everybody has their own version or has their own perception of beauty. And then on the other end, there's something about beauty, universal beauty that inspires us, that motivates us, right? People climb tall mountains just to get a glimpse of beauty. People sell so much of what they have to pay great quantities of money <laughs> Or something like a painting that inherently probably costs very little to make, but there's something beautiful about it that you wanted to get it and keep it for yourself. And when seen through the orthodox perspective, this is probably one of the most important topics you will hear because our perception of beauty determines our direction, determines what motivates us, determines what inspires us, and essentially determines whether it really does determine salvation or hell, right? Because we, are, we gravitate towards what we find is beautiful. So, a little bit of an overview. I'm just gonna give you guys the overview ahead of time so you know what we're gonna get into. We're first gonna talk about the orthodox understanding of beauty. And so I apologize, and you know, it's a Tuesday night, and the first part of this talk is very philosophical. So if you guys don't like that stuff, sorry. I know it's kind of, it's a Tuesday night, nobody wants to think that deeply. But if you do like that stuff, I hope, I hope it makes you wonder, and I hope it, it fills you with awe, and just the orthodox stance on where beauty, sta uh, where beauty stands in our faith. Um, so we're gonna talk about the transcendentals. We're gonna talk about beauty in creation how God instilled his beauty in all of creation. We're gonna talk about the consequences of the fall and what happened to beauty because of the fall, or rather I should say our perception of beauty because of the fall. And then we're gonna talk about the restoration of beauty through Christ. And then the second part of our talk is gonna be more practical. This is where we talk about awakening this thing called, we call chaste arrows, what the fathers call chaste arrows, which is basically just desiring love through asceticism, right? And especially as we enter into Lent, um, I do wanna speak about asceticism and its role in beauty. And then finally, uh, we're going to talk about this model of beauty called the beauty first approach to salvation. How to attain salvation through our perception of beauty, okay? All right, so where to start? The three transcendentals. Have you got any, any philosophy majors just wondering? I think la one of the times I came here, I spoke to one of the people who, and she was a philosophy major. I don't know if she's here, but, <laughs> but um, so she was a philosophy major. Um, so the three transcendentals, when we talk about beauty, it must always be in unity with goodness and truth. Now, beauty, goodness, and truth are what Greek philosophers, namely Socrates, um, 
viewed as properties or attributes that transcend this world, that they are good in of, in of themselves. Like, why do, we love, why, do, why do we want truth? Why do we love the truth? Because it's true. It's good, in, it's good in and of itself, right? There's value of it in and of itself. Why do we want goodness? Because it's good. Why do we want beauty? Because it's beautiful, right? They're good in of themselves. Nobody seeks the ugly. Nobody seeks falsehood and lies. Nobody seeks evil. We all gravitate towards these three transcendentals. And so we must understand beauty in the context of goodness and truth. And it cannot exist without that. Because, let me put it this way, what is, what is something that is true, quote-unquote true, that is not beautiful or good? Just empty words. It's no longer truth, right? What is beauty that doesn't lead you to goodness and truth? Just idolatry. It doesn't lead to the truth, and it's, not, and it's no longer rooted in goodness. It's just idolatry, right? So we must understand these three things within... It, within each other, they they are they're all uh, united. Now the Orthodox fathers saw that Christ is the manifestation of these three things. Christ is the true. Christ is goodness, and Christ is the beautiful, right? So, and that's the Orthodox understanding of these things. That Christ is the manifestation. His incarnation is the manifestation of all truth, all goodness, and all beauty. So let's get into this a little bit. So what is truth? What is truth? I put an icon of uh, the trial because if you guys remember, that's the question Pontius Pilate asked Christ, <laughs> right? When Christ says, um, what did he say? He said, those who seek me know the truth and they abide in me. And then Pontius Pilate responds to him, what is truth, right? And so we know Christ himself says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. I am the truth, the good way, and the beautiful life, right? And so when we talk about truth, what is truth in philosophical terms? It's a matter of being. To be true means you really, you, uh, you exist in reality, right? This is, it, it, and so it's, it's in the concept of creation. All that God creates is true. And being is only part of it. St. Basil goes on to say in his prayer of thanksgiving, O existing one, Master, Lord, God Almighty, and adorable Father, it is truly meet and right and befitting the majesty of thy holiness that we should praise thee, hymn thee, bless thee, worship thee, give thanks unto thee, and glorify thee, the only true existing God. What he's saying here is the only thing that truly exists is God. And anything that wants to be true to itself be what it was created to be, be what it's intended to be, must find its root in the source of that truth. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an analogy for that. Imagine you see this beautiful painting, kind of this abstract, beautiful painting, and you want to know what is the purpose of this painting? What is the meaning of this painting? How will you know? The only way you know is by going to the artist, by going to the creator, right? And so we are truly who we were meant to be, who we were created to be, who we are intended to be, when we are rooted in the truth itself, or I should say the truth himself, okay? Now, that's only part of it also. What is the Greek word for truth? Echristos anesti, alithos alithia, right? Alithia, alithia is the Greek word for truth. Now, just a little bit about Greek. If there's, always, if there's an alpha in the beginning of the word, it's usually a negation of the next part. So the, for example, the Greek word agios usually means holy or saint. Literally just means a, not, geo, of this world, like geology or geography, the world. So agios literally just means not of this world. So that is what holiness is. That's what being a saint is. He, they are not of this world, right? So aletheia means no longer concealed, no longer hidden. What it implies is the truth is a mystery. The truth exists before we even come to know it. But to come to know it, there needs to be this, what St. Basil continues to say. Thou art he that hath graciously bestowed upon us the knowledge of thy truth. 
So we come to know the truth, and it's revealed to us. And the truth in and of itself is entirely a mystery. And it is only revealed to us through this knowledge. And, that what, and this knowledge is not some intellectual knowledge. The word knowledge here that is used um, here and also throughout the Septuagint really is this knowledge that's in the same sense as Abraham knew his wife Sarah and they begot uh, Isaac, right? It's this really deep, profound, intimate, experiential relationship knowledge. And it is through that knowledge, having that intimate relationship, that you become to know, you become to you come to know the truth. You are gravitated by the truth's beauty. Do you see how beauty and truth is um, intertwined? You are you you behold the beauty of the truth, and you come to know it in a very intimate way, and you become to know it. To say it in layman's terms, you cannot truly know what or who you don't love, right? So I'll give you, again, an example. I'm married, my wife. Um, the more that I share my life with her, the more that I grow in relationship with her, the more my love grows for her, the more I discover the truth of Christina. Right? By the way, I know she's probably watching me live. Hi. <laughs> um, the more I get to know the truth of Christina, the more the mystery of the human heart becomes revealed to me through that intimate knowledge. Right? And it's the same way. If we say Christ is the, tr is the truth, we come to know Christ through that experiential knowledge, being gravitated towards his beauty. So now how does truth relate to goodness and, tr and beauty? So we know, we said that truth is a matter of being, it's a matter of creation, it's a matter of being that something that truly exists. And we know that God created everything that God saw everything that he has made, and indeed, it was very good, right? Everybody knows this. This is the first couple chapters of Genesis, right? We, we probably know this already. Now, what's interesting is this word good, if you actually look at it in the, or in the Septuagint Greek or even in the Hebrew, that word could actually be interchanged with the word beauty. The Greek word for good is kali, kali. Now, um, have you guys heard of the philokalia? You guys know the philokalia? You guys heard of it, right? So the philokalia is the Eastern Orthodox book of spirituality. It's a beautiful book. It teaches you to pray the Jesus prayer. It teaches you a lot of the ascetical ways and the watchfulness of the heart and discernment through the spirit. And it's, it's, very, it's a very profound book. The philokalia literally means the love of the beautiful. So it's interesting, the Greek word, the word that we use here to translate good, kali, could also be interchanged for um, beautiful. So God made everything good, God made everything beautiful, okay? Um, I could get into the Hebrew, but I won't just because of time. <laughs> it, it's tav, if you guys were interested, like mazel tav, good luck, it could be interchanged for both goodness and beauty. So what is goodness? What does it mean to be good? Let me ask you this. Is a screwdriver a good hammer? No, it's a good screwdriver. It's not a good hammer. A hammer is a good hammer. So goodness is fulfilling what you're intended to do. Like it's fulfilling a purpose, right? So humanity being made in the image and likeness of God, we are good as long as we are rooted in the goodness, the embodiment of goodness, rooted in Christ. And this is what St. Paul means when he says, Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And what does Christ do? He gives his life to the world, right? And this con concept of agape, this uh, love, sacrificial love for everyone. Almsgiving, the work of love, laboring. The, the liturgy itself, it, the, the word liturgy means the work of the people, right? So it's this offering of oneself over and over again. And it's the acquisition of virtues. And what we have to understand is it's, we're not just after virtues for the sake of virtues. We're specifically after Christ's virtue, right? We don't just want to be patient. We want Christ's patience. We don't want to just be gentle or kind or humble. We want Christ's humility. And that, we want Christ's gentleness, right? And that could only be if we totally assimilate the entirety of our lives, the entirety of our hearts, and conform it into Christ himself, fulfilling the image of God. So we 
in the likeness of God, we fulfill the image of God. And that's what it means to be good, to fulfill a, what you, you, to be who you were created to be. To, then, you, then you are good to the way Christ created you. Now, let's get into the beautiful, because this is the main topic. This is what the whole talk's about. Now, what is beauty? Beauty is a matter of desire, right? That's why I used an icon of a flame <laughs> to, to describe beauty. Beauty is what gravitates you. It's what pulls you. So God created everything, and he imprinted it with his beauty, right? And we'll, we'll talk about this. And this beauty could also be interchanged with the Greek word doxa, which for doxa batri keo, the word glory. And so it's not some sort of aesthetic beauty. It's not just like some nice looking pleasantry kind of thing, but it's something of, of substance. It's something that is kind of like gold, something heavy, something that inspires reverence, awe, fear. That's why every time an angel appears to someone in the Bible, the first thing they have to say, do not fear. <laughs> do not fear. Don't be afraid. Because their beauty is so marvelous, it inspires this wonder. It inspires this awe. Another way we could see it is theophany. Do you guys know what the word theophany means? The vision of God, seeing God, right? And what we do is it's this revelation of God where we get a glimpse of God and it draws us into him. We want to know him. It, it pulls us in. And it's, it draws us into this life-giving love as experienced in communion. And it's really recognizing the good purpose. So remember how we say goodness and beauty are interchangeable. It's realizing the good purpose of everything is a revelation of God's beauty and a means of communion with him. Meaning all that God has given us the, int the intention of all of creation was meant to be a gift for humanity so that we see God in it and that the only response we could give for all the blessings he gave us is thanksgiving, joy, adoration, and we offer that back to him. Because what can we give God in return? Nothing except one thing, thanksgiving, right? And that is the intention of man. man God, God created man to be thankful to be full of gratitude, to be, ter the term is Eucharistic, right? We, we call communion the Eucharist. You know why it's called the Eucharist? Eucharist is the Greek word for thanksgiving. That was what man was intended to be, to behold God's beauty in all that he has been given and be drawn into God because of it. That all of creation is meant to be a sacrament between him and God, a means of union, a means of communion with him. And... Truly, beauty is what I write here. We become truly human in the movement of our hearts into the silent awe and wonder at the mystery of God. Again, it's this concept that there's really nothing that can be said. And so we're just in awe and wonder. It reminds me of St. Mary during the nativity after she gave birth to Christ. Do you remember how Luke describes her? And she pondered these things in her heart because there's nothing that can be said in front of God and so this is why St. Gregory of Nyssa says, only wonder understands anything. Only wonder understands anything. Because that's the only appropriate response to the glory of God. Right? He goes on to say, like the Bible is obviously the word of God. And why is it the word of God? Because it points us to the word of God. It reaches who is Christ himself. Christ himself is the word of God. And what St. Gregory says is more can be known about Christ in the spaces between the words of the gospel and the actual words of themselves. Because the word of the cross itself is silence, it's stillness. In the Psalms it says, be still and know that I am God. And it's all, and all of that is an aspect of God's beauty. I didn't lose anyone, right? <laughs> okay, we're all good. Any questions about this? Okay, so again, just a little bit of a reiteration. Um, heaven and earth are filled with your holy beauty. Where did I get this from? It used to be holy glory. Remember the cherubim worship you and the seraphim, right? Proclaiming, saying, holy, holy, holy. Heaven and earth are filled with your holy glory, right? And so again, this word glory is meant to, it could be translated also, be filled with your holy beauty. And so Father Alexander Schmemann, who wrote for the life of the world, 
probably describes this better than anyone else. So I'm just going to read what he says. I want you guys to pay attention. And here he is talking about how all of creation is filled with God's beauty and how it's meant to draw us into him, to see his beauty in all things, and we, and we are drawn into him because of it. This is what he says. All that exists is God's gift to man, and it all exists to make God known to man, to make man's life communion with God. It is divine love made food, made life for man. God blesses everything he creates, and in biblical language, this means he makes all creation the signs and means of his presence and wisdom, love and revelation, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We had to ascend to heaven in Christ to see, to understand that creation in its real being as glorification of God. So all of creation is meant to be the glorification of God, drawing us into him and his beauty. As that response to divine love in which alone creation becomes what God wants it to be, thanksgiving, Eucharist, and adoration. And this is really the intention of our life. This is why God created us, so that we could share in this glory, to share in this beauty. This is the ultimate purpose of all that, create, of all that exists, the end, the goal, and the fulfillment, because this is the beginning and the principle of creation. Okay? St. John Chrysostom goes on to say, and he describes this, again, better than a lot of people I know, the sky is beautiful, but it is so in order that you may bow down before him who made it. The sun is bright, but it is so in order that you may worship its author. And again, this is the intention, the good purpose of all creation, to be drawn into the truth, to be drawn into Christ himself. Okay? So again, I know, very philosophical, very theological. Are, are, are there any questions or anything I, you, you guys want me to clarify or ask? No? Okay. I hope I didn't lose anyone. <laughs> I know sometimes, sometimes if, if it gets too philosophical, especially on a Tuesday night, um, <laughs> it might go over some people's heads. So I'm, I apologize in advance. Then the fall happened, right? And then the fall happened. So what happened to beauty because of the fall? And so Father Alexander Schmemann goes on to summarize the fall as the only real fall of man is a non-Eucharistic life in a non-Eucharistic world. So what does that mean? That we no longer see the iconicity coming from the word icon, meaning a window into heaven, all of creation stops becoming an icon for us. We, we, like, so iconicity means seeing the world as an icon of theophany, seeing God's beauty in it, and returning to the beauty of God, and seeing all of the world, seeing everything that God gives us as a blessing, as a means of communion and union into him through thanksgiving, adoration, and love. When we no longer see things as a means to God, but as, a, but as an end to themselves, and really as an end for our own self-gratification. So do you see that? Instead of gratitude, we now have self-gratification. Instead of pointing it to Christ, directing it to Christ, we now direct it to our own selfish egos or our own self-consumption. That same thing now becomes an idol. So it, transform, it becomes, in our perception, from an icon to an idol. And what idolatry is, is seeing the world as an end to itself for self-conception, self-pleasure, self-gratification, independent from God. We don't want God in our lives anymore. We just want that thing for ourselves. Okay? And here's the problem. When these things are no longer rooted in God, and they are no longer rooted in absoluteness, because God is the absolute, now we get this humanity's view on truth, goodness, and beauty as very distorted and confused into notions of relativity. This is where you get these concept of this is my truth and this is your truth and the relativity of truth. And the relativity of truth in and of itself is the destruction of truth because you can't make truth relative. If truth is relative, then you are essentially saying there is no truth, right? Because if your, his truth contradicts that truth, then what is the truth? Right? So it's no longer rooted in absoluteness. And goodness itself, morality, is now confused. What makes something good? 
I mean, to take it to an extreme, the Holocaust, the Nazis thought that what they were doing was good, right? When you have a terrorist, um, a jihadi terrorist who blows himself up and kills millions of people, he thinks what he's doing is good, right? So you have this con very confused notion of goodness. And also we have a very confused notion of what's beauty. And this is where you get the term beauty is in the eye of the beholder. As an Orthodox Christian, we don't believe in that, right? One of the fathers that I read, he's a contemporary father, and he basically said it's a demonic statement. It's not true. Beauty it must always be rooted in God. And so we're going to expand on this a little bit. And here's the thing. Even in our modern world today, you know, after the, after the resurrection of our Lord, these topics, especially in the West, are highly talked about, but for some, like, so we are willing to debate the truth, right? We have people debating the truth all the time and coming to s sort of an investigation on what is, what is true, right? Most of universities are like that, right? And we have investigations and debates about what is goodness. Nobody ever really talks about beauty. It's, it's often neglected, right? Nobody wants to talk about beauty because it's just seen as some superficial, romantic, like whatever, bias, right? And we actually see this in our definition of ethics, right? So how do you guys, how do you guys define contemporary ethics? Any, any, are, are you the philosophy major? There you are. <laughs> I was just talking to you about you earlier in the talk <laughs> because we were talking about. So, what does, uh, what does ethics mean? What, what, how, how would one define contemporary? And ethics is important. Our understanding of ethics dictates the laws and the politics of the land we live in, right? So what is ethics? If you look at the definition of ethics in most of our universities, it's the body of knowledge that investigates morality. The body of knowledge, the truth, investigating morality, what is good. Where's beauty? Beauty is nowhere to be seen in, in our contemporary understanding of these things. Um, and we see this kind of seep in in the West. So we talk about the neglect of beauty in the West has distorted our modern approach to Christianity. Because as you may know, especially in, when I talk about Western Christianity, I'm mostly talking about Europe, <laughs> European Christianity, and then it got passed on to the States where we live today. Um, and you could see how these notions infiltrate our, 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 the other churches that are not Orthodox, but sometimes they infiltrate, sometimes they're, because, you know, the West is so dominant in, our, in the world today, Western culture is so dominant, it sometimes infiltrates our church, so we need to be aware of it. And what we see is the Western Enlightenment movement, so the Renaissance, <laughs> if you will, focused a lot on the intellectual rationalization to explain the world. The problem, and this is good because it brought advances to science and it brought advances to medicine and you name it. But the problem is when you try to apply this system to our understanding of faith. Because what happens is you have this methodology and it was translated in the Western church's attempt to intellectualize the mysteries, intellectualize the sacraments. And by doing so, you sort of, Put a death to the mystical heart, right? Because now what you're doing is you're dichotomizing what is secular and what is, what is spiritual. When in Christianity, we don't view the dichotomy. Like in Orthodox Christianity, I should say, we don't see a dichotomy between secular and, and spiritual. We see all things as, like, we see the union of both, heaven and earth reconciled, the reconciliation of both, right? And what this created was a skepticism, right? And you could see this lingering on today even in our modern approach to understanding the world and philosophy and so on. And so, again, with the neglect of beauty, we have two approaches in Western Christianity that we don't necessarily agree with. And the first one is a truth-first approach to Christianity. And so what's this truth-first approach to Christianity? It's sort of this rationalization, this sort of over, over intellectualizing the things that you're not supposed to be taught, the, the, the things that cannot be talked about. Because again, a lot of 
a lot of our Orthodox tradition is rooted in mystery and rooted in the humility of, of no, knowing that we cannot comprehend these things the, and trying to understand the sacraments. Because in the Western church, you have things like the doctrine of transubstantiation. And what they do is you have the body and blood and you put it under a microscope to see if you could actually see cells. And like, you know, things like that. Oh, because the, the bread turns into the body of Christ. So how does it actually turn into the body of Christ? It's a mystery, right? That's how the Orthodox Church understands it. But in, our, in the Western approach to try to intellectualize it, this is what they fell into. And what happens, and when you have this truth-first approach to Christianity, what happens is you reduce Christianity to this sort of abstract knowledge of Christ. Meaning, you know him abstractly. You could describe Christ. You're able to academically explain salvation. And you're able to explain the historical Jesus and how Christianity is real and all of that. Right? We're able to, we're able to explain all that. But we don't know Christ intimately. We don't know Christ as the bridegroom. It's just, a, it's just the abstract Jesus, but not the bridegroom Jesus, the Jesus of our lives, right? The Jesus who is the fulfillment of our lives. And so this, this leads to a whole, a whole sect of Christianity going down that route. And then you have the other route, which is the goodness first approach. Now, what's the goodness first approach? Again, remember, beauty is neglected in this. And the goodness first approach is the reduction of Christianity to this moral, moralistic therapeutic deism. What does that mean? Moralistic, meaning it's focused on good works and service and all that kind of stuff, which is good. But the purpose of that is therapeutic, to feel better about yourself. So you're just doing good for the sake of feeling better about yourself. In deism, we include God in it. Right? So that's why you see in a lot, of, like, let's include God in it. So what happens is you reduce the church to sort of a self-help lecture, right? How to, you know, how to be a better husband, and then let's add, sprinkle some Bible verses in that, you know, so things like that. And again, they're not, that's, it's not bad, it's therapeutic, but it's not salvific. Because again, it's not rooted in the entirety of focusing on the beauty of Christ and, and filling our entire lives with him, conforming our entire lives with him. So again, moralistic Christianity could, could lead to pride because what happens is you start taking pride in the good works that you do, right? Like, oh, all the, all the you start doing good for the sake of, I'm not such a bad person. Like all these people who are outside the church, they're not like me. At least I do this, and at least I do this service, and at least I do this in the church, right? And it leads to this Puritan mindset that's rooted, that's ro essentially rooted in the ego. It's ro essentially rooted in pride. It could also lead to self-justification. It could lead to judging others who are not doing the good that you do. And again, it's all about seeking a sense of self-control and self-help, but it's not rooted in the abandonment of oneself for the sake of Christ. You see the difference? So again, you could see how Western Christianity kind of fall into those two dichotomies. And like with the, you, you hear about the evangelical work ethic, <laughs> you know, and, and you could see this in a lot of the politics and the Republican Party and all like, oh, pick yourself up by the bootstraps. You could see how that infiltrates into, um, into Western modes of Christianity. Any question? I know this, this part of the talk is maybe a little bit more controversial because I'm so, uh, any debate, anything, anything anybody wants to debate or talk about or have a question about. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't lose anyone. So how is beauty restored in our lives? How is our perception of beauty restored? What is the shape of beauty? It's right there. The cross, right? God shows us his beauty in the cross. Because if idolatry is rooted in self-gratification and egotistical desires, then beauty must always have an element of humility. This concept of self-emptying, what we call the kenotic, this cruciform love, this kenotic, do you know, have you guys heard of the word kenosis? In the Greek, in the fathers, they talk about kenosis, this self-emptying, 
the self-emptying love, the abandonment of oneself for the sake of the other, the complete emptiness, emptying of oneself in humility, in love for the sake of the other. That's what Christ showed us on the cross, right? The, in, uh, St. Paul describes this in Philippians. And so let's talk about this. So what we need to understand is the cross is, has always been an aspect of the beautiful and an aspect of creation itself. A lot of times we think the cross is reactionary to the fall, but what, when we read the fathers, we, what we actually see is the cross is very much so an ontological aspect of beauty itself. And so let me get into this. This is Dr. Timothy Petitsas in a book called The Ethics of Beauty, and here he summarizes um, the words of St. Maximus, the confessor. He sort of paraphrases it. And so this is what he says. Creation results from God's self-emptying over the face of non-being. God appears. He shines out as beauty. And this beauty is so compelling that not even non-being can resist falling in love with it. Overcome with arrows. So we're going to talk about arrows. Overcome with arrows. Non-being renounces itself, repents of its chaos and self-absorption, and arises into being. And, and as it does so, it learns to behave as the one it loves behaves, full of self-emptying goodness for everything around it. Thus, everything that is created is marked with a cruciform love. What does all this mean? <laughs> what does all this mean? It, basically, what he's saying is the cross has... Is, God's self-emptying is always an aspect of his creation, and it's that self-emptying that draws us in. Let me put it this way. In creation, Genesis describes it as seven days, right? He's God, right? Well, can't he just create it like that? But no, Genesis, the word of God, makes it very intentional that it takes seven days. And if you understand numerology, we know that seven means infinite, eternity, right? And so what you see is what God is trying to show us is that his creation is a labor of love. In the same way an artist pours himself out onto his painting, God pours himself out onto all of creation. And he even makes himself vulnerable. And that, again, that's part of his self-emptying. And how does he make himself vulnerable? Because you have to understand, God knows everything that happens before it even happens. So he knows before creation, he was going to create man in his image and likeness. And he knew man created in his image of likeness will be given the gift of free will. And he knows that ahead of time that man will fall and that he would not watch, could not bear or would not bear to watch his creation fall and that he would have to send his only begotten son to be humiliated, to be beaten, to, be, to take on every trauma and tragedy, if you really think about it. Um, and really, every tragedy, every trauma could be identified with the passion of Christ. If you think about it, being, um, being betrayed by a loved one, being betrayed for very cheap, being violated, being abused physically, emotionally, psychologically, having an unjust trial, just that in of itself. When we hear somebody who is condemned to life in prison, unjustly, we get all angry. And like, so we have this unjust trial. We have a man dying young, the tragedy of somebody dying young. We have the tragedy of somebody dying in their prime. Like remember when Kobe passed away, every, a lot of people's hearts were broken that day because it, it's like seeing someone like, you know, he, like his life is just beginning and it, like he, he finally finished basketball and he's about to enter this whole other world of his life and he's, he just goes. And so that's a tragedy and a trauma in and of itself. And just being stripped naked, being stripped emotionally, psychologically, in every human aspect. And on top of all that, being humiliated, tortured in front of your own mother and watching her with a sword pierce through her heart. And now you have to bear that. <laughs> you know, you have to bear your own mother's agony over, you, over who you are. And why does Christ do all this? He takes in all this trauma and he puts it into himself so that whenever we inevitably face some sort of suffering, some sort of trauma or tragedy in our lives, we are now able to relate it to him and know that the resurrection always comes after the crucifixion. Know that Christ always has the final word. And so, and this is really the aspect of beauty, the self, and, and mind you, 
God knew all this ahead of time, and he still created us anyways. Imagine that, <laughs> right? He knew what he, he would have to go through, and he still created us anyways. And so what can we take away from this? There's two criteria for recognizing true beauty. Two criteria, and these are the two criteria. Number one, everything beautiful, there's always a hidden cross in it. There's always a hidden cross in everything that's beautiful. I'll give you an example. Marriage. A marriage that's all intimate and it's fun and living with your best friend and the romance and the dates and all that, all that flowery stuff. Without self-emptying sacrifice, the man giving his life to his wife and the obedience of the wife to the husband is not a beautiful marriage. There must be that cross. And that cross is actually what makes it beautiful. It's, it, th that is the definition of beauty. Okay? It's the same way. If you hear, like, imagine an, uh, a musician pouring himself out on the keyboard or on, on a piano or on a guitar compared to some artificial intelligence do, playing the same exact melodies, the same exact notes. There's a difference. One is beautiful and the other one, you could hear the artificiality of it, right? So, again, there must be a pouring out. There must be a self-emptying. There must be a hidden cross in all that is beautiful. And number two, it needs to inspire this chaste eros that directs us back to Christ the beautiful. So what is this chaste eros that I keep talking about? Here, I'm going to share this quote by St. Porphyrios before I do, just because I love it. And it kind of describes this whole thing. This is what he says. This is from Wounded by Love. If you guys are looking for a Lenten book, this is one of the best Lenten books. Whoever wants to become a Christian must first become a poet. That's what it is. You must suffer. You must love and suffer. Suffer for the one you love. Love makes effort for the loved one. She runs all through the night. She stays awake. She stains her feet with blood in order to meet her beloved. She makes sacrifices and disregards all impediments, threats, and difficulties for the sake of the loved one. And love towards Christ is something even higher, infinitely higher. So, and what St. Porphyrios here is describing is eros. Chaste, and we're going to describe chaste eros. So eros in Greek is literally just translated into love. So here's the thing. The English language is kind of lame. <laughs> it just has the word love. The Greeks have four different words for love. Do you guys know about this? The four different words for love. So we know philo. Philo, which means like the love of friendship. Like, have you heard of, uh, any, if you're a science major, hydrophilic, hydrophilic, meaning it's friends with water, right? So the word philo means like the love of friendship. So Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, philo. You have storge. And storge, it's, I don't know if it's storge or storge, but it's S-T-O-R-G-E. And this describes an instinctual love, like a love like when, I, when my wife gave birth to my daughter and the first time I held my daughter, I felt this storage love, this instinctual love, this familial love for her. Then there's agape, and that's the one everybody knows, and that's God's love. That's the sacrificial love of giving one's life for someone else. And now we have eros. And eros is described as this self-abandoning love. This here, let me, let me read what I wrote here because, so the true meaning of Eros is it's a love that makes you forget yourself entirely and run towards the other without regard for yourself. It's this really romantic love, <laughs> right? It's a very romantic love. And so um, it's, and when we talk about chaste Eros, so we talk about chastity versus um, lust. Chastity the way it's understood in, in, in orthodoxy is it's well-ordered love. So when we talk about chaste eros, we talk about this well-ordered, this correctly ordered, this rightly ordered love. And it's the love that makes you renounce yourself, renounce your ego, renounce yourself for the sake of the beloved. And who gives us this example? God himself. He comes down from heaven, leaves everything behind, forgets himself in that he takes on the cross, our cross, for our sake. And really, the Songs of Solomon, if you read the Songs of Solomon, it's 
littered with this arrows that God has for us, right? Has, that the bridegroom has for the church. And so when we are called to conform into the life of Christ, this is, this is where we talk about chaste arrows. And so I have two icons here, and they basically describe this better than anyone I could imagine. Um, one is the sinful woman. And if you remember the sinful woman, do you guys remember her story? She sells all that she has to buy this expensive perfume. And she enters a Pharisee's house and she, knowing that she's going to be condemned, judged, ridiculed, but she doesn't care because all she wants to do is meet Christ. And she goes and sells all that she has and pours the ointment on his head, gets on her knees, cries and wipes his feet with her tears, when, with her hair on her tears. And do you remember what Christ says? Today your sins will be forgiven. Why? You guys remember? For she loved much. For she loved much. So you could see this eros is the seed of agape. This desiring love for the beloved is what pulls us into Christ. And again, we see, so again, chaste eros is blessed. St. John Climacus, the one who wrote the Ladder of Divine Ascent, he, he writes in his last step um, on this passion, blessed is he who has obtained such love and yearning for God as an enraptured love for, uh, lover for his beloved. I know usually when you think of like Christianity and the, or the fathers, we think of like this very dry, um, <laughs> dry kind of religion or very, it's, it's actually not. If you actually read the fathers, it's very romantic. <laughs> it's, it's, it's filled with passion. It's filled with love. It's filled with desire. And so here you have St. John Climac is saying like an enraptured lover for his beloved, somebody that you're crazy about and just going, leaving everything behind and going after him. And who better example than the sinful woman in St. Mary of Egypt herself, right? And you could see how she's an example of, world, of somebody who had worldly lust arrows, arrows for the world, this lustful arrows, this, if chastity is well-ordered love, then lust is disordered love. It's a disorder. And that's the way orthodoxy views most sins. It's, it's not so much... Um, I mean, obviously, we view it as, like, the breaking of the law and all that, but we more so see it as an illness, as something that we need healing from. And what St. Isaac the Syrian describes is the world is a harlot who, by lust of her beauty, so the world itself has this idolatrous beauty, entices those who behold her to love her. And you could see how Christ was able to transform this eros, this attribute this God-given attribute of St. Mary of Egypt, where it was one directed towards her flesh, now directed towards God. And what does she do? She runs into the desert, leaves everything behind in pursuit of the one she, of the, of, because she got a glimpse of that beauty. She got a glimpse of the beauty of God, right? And so Fyodor Dostoevsky describes the struggle between chaste eros and lustful eros. The terrible thing about beauty is it's not only fearful, but it's also mysterious. Here the devil is struggling with God, and the battlefield is the human heart. Okay? So now we're going to talk about the very practical aspect of all this. How do we overcome worldly arrows? The arrows for the world? Or a better question I should ask you is how do we cultivate, foster this chaste arrows, this arrows towards God? What does St. Mary of Egypt do? She runs into the desert. And for 17 years, she battled with the demons, right? And so asceticism is the answer. And that's the prescription that's given to us by our fathers. And this might come to a surprise for you because like, oh, he flipped it on me. He said asceticism, <laughs> right? Because sometimes we think of asceticism as this very like rigorous exercise and it's sort of dry. And that's actually not the way it's supposed to be. Um, as you know, we're not the only religion that fasts, right? We have Islam, and they fast Ramadan, right? They, they stole it from us. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> well, kind of. Um, we have Islam, and we also have Buddhists who fast. But what you see is the intention behind both ascetic, all the asceticisms are very different. So why do Muslims fast? Do you guys know? It's one of their five pillars of Islam. So a lot of 
there's really two main reasons. One is to empathize with the poor, like, oh, be grateful because you're not poor, so uh, like this is how a poor person feels, so you should be grateful for the food you have. Cool. Um, number two, it's this concept of self-control, right? And sometimes that kind of penetrates into our understanding of, uh, of asceticism. It's all about self-control. And Christ actually tells us, talks about this. And self-control is fine and dandy, but it can't be the end, right? And Christ gives us a parable. I don't know if, do you guys remember the parable of the demon that was cast out? Do you guys remember what happened? So there was a demon that was cast out, and it wanders into the wilderness. It comes back to the original host and sees the house is empty. And so what does it do? It invites seven of its friends, and the state of the worst is, is worse than the last. What does that mean? So a lot of times when we approach asceticism with a, with a sense of self-control and self-will, again, it's not rooted in Christ. It's rooted in our sense of wanting self-control, right? It's rooted in ego. And the fathers actually noticed a lot of monks falling into this trap. And what can happen is you could become a Pharisee because the Pharisees were really good at fasting. They were very good at keeping the law, right? They were, they were obeying all the commandments, right? Good, fine and dandy, but they were missing love, right? They were missing. So what happened is they were filled with pride and judgment, and a lot of times that could be us, right? Some, a lot of times in our sense of self-control, in our sense of ego, in our sense of, of bolstering ourselves, we could use asceticism as a means of that, and that's what the fathers call a demonic asceticism. So asceticism could be used incorrectly. And could be used gravely. And then you have the Buddhists, and do you remember, do you know why they fast? What's the whole Buddhist, the, uh, what's the whole Buddhist mentality? Get rid of desire, and you don't have to suffer, right? So if you destroy, so if, if, you, if you're able to control your desires, then you'll never have to suffer, because suffering is rooted in desire. We actually don't agree with that. As Christians, we believe that desire is one of the most essential components of being a human being. But it's where we re redirect our desires. It's where we direct our desires. So I'm going to read what St. Porphyrius again writes about fighting evil. And really, this is what we need to approach asceticism with. This is what he says. No one ever became holy by fighting evil. We only become holy by falling in love with Christ. No one becomes holy by fighting evil. And every addict could attest to this statement. An alcoholic, you know, the 12-step program is actually based on this, <laughs> the 12, uh, on how to get rid of addiction. Because the more and more we try to fight the evil, the more likely when it's just we're white-knuckling it and we're just trying to fight it ourselves with, with our own self-zeal, what eventually happens? You will fall, right? Because it's just part of our human brokenness. So the more we, and so an alcoholic, the more they, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, eventually they're going to fall into that. And so the 12-step program talks all about a whole other way of going it, one of submission and one of finding a, a, a deeper love, right? And again, um, I mean, and you, you, I mean, we could just in trying to lose weight. We're trying to say, "I'm not going to eat that cookie. I'm not going to eat that cookie. I'm not going to eat that cookie." What's going to happen? You're going to eat that cookie, <laughs> right? I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to fall into that sin again. I'm not going to fall into that sin again. I know I'm not. I know I'm not. I'm better than that. What's going to happen? You're probably going to fall into that sin again, because such is human nature. What Saint Porfirio says is, where you put your attention is what grows. So if you put all your attention on not sinning, what you're doing is you're watering the sin. You're, ma you're implanting it to your mind. What you're supposed to be doing instead is directing it to God, directing it to Christ, direct all your attention to Christ. And so, that, so I have this picture up. Do you guys know who that is? That's St. Anthony. And so I'm going to read you a part of St. Athanasius' Life of St. Anthony. He write, as you might know, he wrote the biography of St. Anthony. And it describes what happens when St. Anthony was tempted with a barrage of temptations by the devil and how St. Anthony overcame them. And he didn't overcome them by paying attention to them. I'll tell you how he does it. So this is what St. Athanasius writes. But when the enemy saw himself to be too weak for Anthony's determination, then at length, putting his trust in the weapons which are of the navel of his belly, meaning he's going to start tempting 
Anthony with sexual temptations because at the time Anthony was very young. And sexual temptations, as the fathers say, is one of the first things or one of the primary things that the devil uses against the youth. And boasting in them, for they are his snare for the young. See, St. Athanasius himself says it, <laughs> right? For they are his snare for the young. He attacked the young man, disturbing him by night, harassing him by day. The one would suggest foul thoughts, but the other would counter them with prayers. So you could see the devil is just trying to plant all these sexual thoughts, these sexual temptations into Anthony so that he could fall. But how does St. Anthony counter them? With prayer, focusing on Christ. The one fires him with lust. The other one, who's, who seemed to blush, fortifies his body with faith, prayers, and fasting. And fasting. And the devil, the unhappy wretch, even one night took the shape of a woman and imitated all her ways simply to beguile Anthony. But he, his mind filled with Christ, and the nobility inspired him, and considered spirituality of the soul, quenched the coal of the other's deceit. So what you have in this picture is you have the devil trying to tempt Anthony, trying to bring him into the lust of the world. And Anthony, all his mind is focused on his true beloved. And that is, the, and he does this by fasting. Fasting is one of the components. Asceticism is one of the components. So what's the point of asceticism? Asceticism, the, the purpose of it is to redirect all your desires, whether it's a desire for lahma <laughs> or just hunger in general, to redirect all your appetites towards the only one who could fulfill you, uh, who could fulfill you spiritually. There's a reason the church in its wisdom asks us to fast before we approach communion. It's not because of whatever ritual, like the, the purpose of it is the, we're supposed to be hungry. <laughs> we're supposed to be physically hungry. But the idea is that physical hunger is supposed to be redirected to our spiritual poverty, the, our hunger for Christ, that our souls, are, our hearts are restless unless they rest in you. It creates that anticipation so that before you partake of the Eucharist, and then when you finally take it, you are fulfilled by the body of Christ, that you are saved by his body and his blood. And it's supposed to create this constant acknowledgement of him, right? And so... And it's a funny thing about food. We sort of live our lives from meal to meal to meal, right? As soon as you wake up, oh, what time is breakfast? What am I having? Okay, and after breakfast, oh, the next thing I'm having is lunch, and, you know, and then after lunch. And so we live our lives from meal to meal to meal to meal. And what the church sees is we could use that. And instead of living our lives from meal to meal to meal, we live our lives from Eucharist to Eucharist to Eucharist to Eucharist. Every means of food is is meant to be all our appetites are directed towards christ all our as all our desires are directed towards the only one who could fulfill us do you see that and it's supposed to keep christ always on your mind and again i mean if you think about do you guys know saint bishoy you guys know his story what ascetical feat is he best known for have you guys been to the monastery of saint bishoy in egypt anybody here no? Okay. So uh, what he has been known for is tying his hair up to the ceiling and staying up all night praying. Is there anything holy in staying up all night? No. The answer is no. The, the, there's nothing holy about staying up all night. But why did he do it? Because it, he, in his eyes, staying awake and praying and conversing with God was better than sleeping. You know, like when you love someone, you know, like when two people are in love and like when during the early stages and they talk through all through the night. That's what St. Bishoy was doing. He was talking all through the night with God. For him, talking with God through the night was better than sleeping and he would rather not sleep. Again, there's nothing holy in being a vegan. Right? We live in L.A. There are vegans better than us out there <laughs> who read every ingredient and make sure not a taste, not like not even from the, a factory that ha slaughters cows, right? Like they're that strict. The holiness isn't found in the being a vegan. The holiness is found in loving God. The holiness is found in redirecting all our appetites, all our desires towards him. And that alone becomes our salvation. So I know I took long. This is my last slide. 
Um, this is my last slide. I'm not going to scare you guys, but I once gave a Sunday school lesson, took an hour just on this slide alone. I'm not going to do this to you. I'm not going to do this to you. <laughs> but I'm going to quickly summarize it. But this is what we call the beauty first approach. So we talked about, remember how I talked about the truth first approach to Christianity and the goodness first approach to Christianity? This is where we take on the beauty first approach to Christianity. And so I took this model that the fathers use. Have you heard of the purification, illumination, and theosis model or deification model of salvation? So again, the, the fathers speak about this a lot, especially the more contemporary fathers from Mount Athos. Um, and they describe the journey of salvation. Again, it's not supposed to be a process, these three things. And again, so I, I put purification as beauty, illumination as goodness, and deification as truth. And if you remember, these three th things exist in their unity. And the same thing, purification, illumination, and deification exist in their unity. And, but it's, the idea is how it starts and it's sort of a natural, it's like the natural consequence or the natural flowering of one goes into the other, but all three exist within the same time. Um, so, and this is how the fathers explain the Christian way of life to theosis. Do you guys know what theosis means? Have you guys heard of that as means of salvation, meaning becoming one with God, becoming like Christ? Deification meaning becoming like God. In the words of St. Athanasius, God became man so we men could become like God, right? Um, and that is what salvation is. What heaven is, is that communion with God, that unity with him, that intimate, um, that intimate love, that intimate union between the bridegroom and his church, right? So how, do, how does this happen? First is purification. First is purification. And this is where beauty starts. We need to capture beauty. And this is where we do the sensitization this is what's described as the sensitization and cultivation of chaste arrows through grace and asceticism. So a lot of times I might hear, well, I just don't, f I don't have that desire, right? I don't have that, um, that sensitization. And a lot of the times we don't have that desire is because we're desensitized by our own sinfulness. There's something else filling our hearts something fleeting, something of this world, right? And it's just so, sort of, and so we become desensitized. We stop feeling God because we've made our hearts numb to him because we're feeling it with worldly pleasures, if you will. And, you know, think of it as desensitization, like when you live in that sinfulness, you don't even realize it anymore. You know, like when someone is a chronic smoker, um, they're smoking all the time, and they smell terrible, <laughs> right? They smell, like, they smell like cigarettes. Do you think they know how they smell like? No, they're used to it. They've become desensitized to it. And it actually blunts their own senses that when something actually beautiful, something that smells beautiful passes by them, they can't even smell it because they're just filled with all this darkness, with all this, uh, with this smokiness. It's meant to be an analogy to show uh, the the process of desensitization. So what asceticism is supposed, to be, is supposed to help is supposed to show us our poverty. And in our hunger, when we are hungry, when we are tired in our labor, in our ascetical labors, in our ascetical exercises, we come to know our poverty. And we redirect that poverty to the recognition of our true spiritual poverty, our brokenness without God. And that and through that humility, it prepares our heart for the grace that God gives us, right? And so you see that pure faith is rooted in the burning desire, that intimacy with Christ. So asceticism is the cross, right? Asceticism is the purification of your desires. It's realizing the true beauty. It's the renunciation of every false beauty, every fleeting thing that maybe gives you a temporary pleasure because sin has a sweet, sweetness to it, right? That's why we like it. Right? That's why we sometimes gravitate to it. There's something about fulfilling our egos, our vanity. That's why we all do it, <laughs> you know. Um, but and the so and asceticism is rooted in the renunciation of that, renunciation of the world. These things that seemingly are benign, but they take up space in our heart and redirect it towards God. And what happens is, through through the ascetic labors, keeping God consistently on your mind. 
you have this process of illumination. And what illumination means is having this incarnational view of Christ in everything. Being able to see Christ is literally illuminated in every aspect of your life because he's consistently on your mind, right? He's consistently on your mind. So to the point, have you, anybody have children here? You have children? Okay, there's a, have you heard of the children's book, Love Comes Down? There's this children's book that I read to my daughter. It's one of her favorite uh, bedtime books. It's called Love Comes Down. And the purpose of the book is to instill an incarnational, a sacramental view of the world in little children, right? So the, the, the book goes, see how the sun shines to kiss your face, how snow falls to crown your hair, how leaves fall to dance around your head, how rain brings flowers everywhere. And what it's supposed to be is a true Christian, a true Orthodox Christian, a true Christian who is Eucharistic is able to see Christ everywhere present and fill in, fill in all things. That a sun ray hitting his head and feeling the warmth of the sun is like the warmth of a kiss from God, feeling God kissing him. That when the snow, yeah, it's called Love Comes Down. <laughs> if you're, it's a really good book, and you have to sing it. The kids love it. Um, and there, like when snow falls around your head, it's, it's as if Christ himself is p placing a crown on top of your head. And that's really the early, how the early Christians viewed their life. Everything was a means of communion with God. They had this sacramental view of God. Everything was a means of communion with him. From the food they ate to the air they breathed, every, every breath they take, they remember the Holy Spirit that fills them. Every time they eat, they remember the Eucharist so that their meal, every meal, becomes an extension of the Eucharist they take every Sunday, right? You have, they wake up and they remember the resurrection. They see a ray of sun breaking through the clouds and they remember that life, like that Christ always, has opened the, the brass doors of Hades. And that's the way, the, so what happens is you become illuminated. And what this illumination does is being filled with Christ, being like seeing Christ work in you and seeing Christ's presence in all around you, you are overflowed with that love. And this is where Agebi comes in, that sacrificial love. You could see how Eros, love for the beautiful, is the seed of Agebi, the sacrificial love for other people. So you desire to love others the way Christ loves them, that Christ fills fills you with his love, and that love overflows to all those around you. And this is where goodness comes in, and sharing, sh you want to share the life of Christ through the co-crucifixion, agape, almsgiving, and empathy, love for all those people. And what happens, I'm almost done, <laughs> almost done, I promise, this is the last part, and what happens is deification. The natural consequences of that is people start seeing the light in you. You yourself become a theophany for other people. People are able to see the beauty of Christ shining through you. You become the light of the world. So you could see how when Christ says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those who are purified by, by grace and by the ascetical labors they took to humble themselves and repent and accept that grace. And then when they see God, they become like God. And when they become like God, they themselves become a theophany and draw others to God. And they partake in this thing we call a silent evangelism. That they don't, like St. Matthew the Poor says, Blessed are you, O chaste one, for your appearance is sermon enough. Your appearance is enough to convert others. And we know any convert, if you ask any convert, they weren't persuaded into Christianity by rhetorical debates. They weren't uh, convinced into Christianity by goodness and morality. That's not what convinced them into Christianity. What convinced them is they saw the beauty of Christ and they wanted it to, right? And they were able to, and so what happens is being in the light, you are now more aware of the sins that, like, you know, I, as you step into the light, you are more aware of the sins. So we talk about the hidden sins and unhidden sins. And there are way more hidden sins that we don't know that we are partaking in than the actual unhidden ones. And in light of that, we fall into a deeper asceticism for deeper purity for deeper illumination and deeper theosis. And it's this process that continues over and over again. What St. Paul describes as, St. Paul describes this as, but we with the unveiled face beholding as in the mirror of the glory of the Lord, being transformed into the image from glory to glory, 
just as the Spirit of the Lord. So we are transformed from glory to glory to glory to glory. What St. Nicholas says, Christ is not only my destination, but the inn in which I rest in each night. And St. Isaac the Syrian goes on further to say that each inn is even better than the one before it. That when you've reached a state of wonder and awe and experiencing the love and mercy and beauty of God, and as you continue this journey, the, the next inn is even more beautiful and wondrous than the one before it. And such is the journey of salvation. And such is, the, such is communion with God. And so, last quote, I'm done. <laughs> Chaste and ardent arrows for the beautiful is the first task of human life. And falling in love with beauty is the beginning of every adventure that matters. And so I pray that this Lent becomes one for you that is filled with Christ's presence. That this fast becomes one where you direct every appetite, every desire towards the one thing that is needful, that he fills you with himself and that you experience his beauty, and that you fall in love with his beauty. And that's my prayer for all of you guys tonight. Um, if you guys have any questions, Mina's here. <laughs> Are there any questions or any clarifications or anything? Sorry I took long. How long did I take? Oh, like an hour, 10 minutes? Sorry, guys. <laughs> that's why I keep my phone here. I tend to talk a lot. I'm sorry. It's one of, I'm working on it. Any questions? Mina? Appreciate this talk. One of the things that resonated with me the most is the um, is that um, when you were talking about um, this right here, the purification, illumination, and deification. And I also liked when you were talking about the uh, that our that the um, that uh, when there has never been a way. No one have ever become holy by fighting evil, but by falling in love with Christ. And it's really filling ourselves with God and the word of God and the love of God that we're able to overcome sin, and we're able to overcome any challenges in the world. That if we think like if we can just, um, if we can somehow um, uh, challenge like life, uh, life's problems by ourselves, that we will always um, f fail. And if, and if we did succeed by our own merit, then it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be uh, like a success that, that is attributed to God. Um, so thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, you guys want to do a burning question? I should never ask that question. I should just do the burning question every single time, right? <laughs> Let's do the burning question. Let's do it. We'll, it'll, it'll only take us a very short time. But uh, it's an important segment, and it gets you guys to kind of think, about, think on it. Marine, can you help us with the microphones, too, please? And then, Tony, can you help with the microphone on this side? Uh, okay, the burning question says, goes like this. Um, I forgot the burning question. Did I, what did I, oh my gosh. Um, I had it prepared and then I, Oh, here we go. Okay. Does the Holy Spirit, does the Holy Spirit work in the life of the unbelievers? One more time. Does the Holy Spirit, does it work in the life of people who do not uh, believe in God or believe in Jesus for that matter? Sorry, it's a very hard question, I know, I know. What do you guys think? Does the Holy Spirit work in the life of the unbelievers?
Yeah. Go, George. Give it a shot. <laughs> Turn off. Anyone? No. 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 The Holy Spirit does not work in the life of the unbelievers. What do you guys think? Sounds like a trick question. Huh? <laughs> Oh, I'm told to know. Why no? Uh, I don't think everyone is uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit, correct? Like us? Not everyone is baptized with the Holy Spirit. Can you be baptized with other stuff? Or what? what? You said not everybody's baptized with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So not everybody's baptized. Okay. And so therefore, not everybody receives the Holy Spirit. Correct. Yes, sir. So I, uh, yes. So my answer is yes. If they ask God to reveal Himself to them. If they ask God to reveal Himself, Himself to them, yeah. then they have the Holy Spirit. No, they, they just see the work of the Holy Spirit to help them, guide them, preach and preach God and know who, who God is. And okay. Uh, why do you believe so? And why do you believe so? We'll start with we'll start with you. Experience of some friends. Okay, okay. Experience. So personal experience. What about you? Why do you believe so? Just 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 thoughts. Okay, that's that's fair enough. How many people agree with George? That that the Holy Spirit does not work in the life of the unbelievers. How many people agree with George? One person? That exactly like that? Yeah. Like word for word? Was baptized? Does the Holy Spirit in us work in, in the life of, of non believers? Does the word Holy Spirit in us work in the life of Because we get the Holy Spirit through baptism, so is the question. Does no, the, the Holy question Spirit was from if believers work in the life of non-believers, or is the question basically? I, well, I think the answer to that question would be that the Holy Spirit does work in your life, and by that it affects the life of the unbelievers. But the actual question is: the OP, the original post, says, <laughs> uh, uh, "Does the Holy Spirit work in the life of the unbelievers?" So, what are your things? What do you What do you think? Anybody? We're just here to just chit chat, guys. You have something? Uh huh. What's the difference? So you said God works in their life, but not the Holy Spirit? But isn't God is? The Trinitarian, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Like, something related to God can work in their life, but you, can, I wouldn't necessarily call it the Holy Spirit. You get mm -hmm. what I mean? Okay. Something else other than the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I think that we're all born as God's children, which means that we all have a part of him in us. When we get baptized, we get united with him. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that people who aren't baptized with the Holy Spirit don't have the Holy Spirit. It's just not activated. Just like when we go out without communion for weeks or years, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit has left us. It just kind of dimmed. Okay. So you, yes, you have a question. Yeah. So I'm saying, yeah, it does. Because regardless whether or not you're Christian or baptized, you still have part of God in you. You still have part of the Holy Spirit in you. It just maybe not as activated. So it's there, but just like in lower levels. I guess. Like, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Kind of? Okay. Anybody else? How many people agree with that answer? So we have somebody that says no, and somebody says yes, and then somebody says its levels. What do you guys think? Yes, Maria. You agree with Helen? 
you don't agree. What are you, what do you, you feel like you have so many thoughts rushing <laughs> through your head and like, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think it works on them, but it doesn't come from them. It, maybe they see in someone else okay. or it has like uh, the Holy Spirit in them. So, okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Final thoughts? Going once. Helen, what do you think? The other Helen. You. She's the first Helen. You're the second Helen because you're sitting in the back. No, you're sitting between the red lines. <laughs> what do you think, Helen? Does God. She, oh, you agree with her? Yeah. Oh, because her name is Helen? <laughs> yes. Okay, good answer. They might not know that it's the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, uh, let's read this wonderful answer written by His Holiness, Pope Shenouda. In the story of baptism of Cornelius, while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. This made the believers astonished because... In Acts chapter 10, verse, 40, uh, verse of, uh, 44, it says, Because the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all the Gentiles also. Does this mean that the Holy Spirit works in the lives of the unbelievers? The Holy Spirit does work in the life of unbelievers to make them believe. Or how can they believe without the work of the Holy Spirit in them? Does not the Holy Spirit say, No one can say that Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit? So his answer is yes, that the Holy Spirit can work in the life of unbelievers for the purpose of making them believe. Why? Because we can only say and proclaim that Jesus is our Lord by only having the Holy Spirit inside of us. The work of the Holy Spirit to make people believe differs, however, from his permanent dwelling in a believer. The Holy Spirit may work in the heart of an unbeliever to call him to believe or work a miracle or some wonder to which might lead him to believe. But after believing, in per a person must obtain the Holy Spirit through the holy anointment of the sacrament of chrism so that the Spirit may always work in him. So, the Spirit may also work in the unbelievers for the benefit of the church. There's a scripture part that says, The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, who is the king of Persia, who was a Gentile, and this was the purpose of building the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. There are many other similar events, both in Scripture and in history, that speak of um, the work of the Holy Spirit in the unbeliever's life to benefit the church. So, your guys' answers were all um, uh, very close. That the fact that uh, the Holy Spirit can, is poured upon everybody, but the dwelling place of uh, uh, the Christian or the person who is baptized uh, becomes the Holy Spirit. So we uh, uh, are, because remember it says that, the Holy, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit lives within us. So God does live within us. Um, so that's why we say like when, you, when we wait to go to the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of heaven actually starts today by having the Holy Spirit inside of us. And so uh, we entertain and activate that Holy Spirit who is inside of us by uh, heeding its advice. So then the next question of this burning question series would be, would it be okay for us to um, be married to those who are non-believers? Since the Holy Spirit is with, within them too. Yes and no. Okay, what's yes and what's no? Huh? I might be wrong. I'm just okay, no, I, yeah, we know you. <clears throat> I think without like being baptized or not having the Holy Spirit within you, maybe you guys are going to be like different. Like you guys are not going to share the same. I don't know how to explain it, but you guys are not going to share like the same qualities or like how you were raised is going to be different than how he was raised without the Holy Spirit. Hmm. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's how I No, that's it. no, it's a good answer, but that's for no, right? Yes. That's a no. Then what's the part about yes? Because you said yes and no. Processing. Okay. Processing, okay. Come back to me when you're, okay. when you're there. 
What do you guys think? Is it okay to be uh, uh, to marry non-believers? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I think because in the like the sacrament of marriage, you have to have both members have the Holy Spirit, and they together become one, right? And if you are married to a non-believer. And we assume that this is not the dwelling place, or not assume, but we've come to the conclusion that they're, they don't have the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, then the sacrament of marriage would not be fulfilled. So I'm just using, using like a logical like thinking process. So it wouldn't work. So logically or in the church, it wouldn't work. But can you be married like in the world? Yeah. But truly, like true marriage as Christ sees it, and as God has made it for us, no. Okay. Good answer. I like that. Yes. He took the microphone apart for you. Put it back on together. Thank you. Okay. And he gives you turned off. As a believer, our tradition is to um, be married in the church. And like someone said earlier for the first question, someone has to accept the Holy Spirit. So while we're getting married in the church, you're accepting the Holy Spirit. So if you're an unbeliever and like you're getting married the tra traditional way of a believer, you're going to have to accept the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit. So I, I'm for no. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, okay, so I honestly feel like I don't think it's wrong. However, in the church, I feel like it would be wrong. And if you are trying to get closer to the Holy Spirit and everything, then I think it would be better if you do marry a believer rather than a non-believer. So the, w the way you kind of phrased that made me believe that other than the church, like outside of the church, it would be okay? I don't, I mean, I don't think so. Okay. I think my answer is no. Okay. But I, 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 I don't think it's wrong. Why, so. Okay, let me ask you this. Why would some people say it's okay? How about that? Because it seems like nobody wants to say why it would be okay. But why would some people say that it's okay to marry somebody who is unbeliever? Why would some people say that? Go ahead. Yeah. They just want to get married. They don't care. They don't care. Yeah. yeah. Somebody who's who's care who's who doesn't care. But is there any better answer than 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 that? any other answers? Why would somebody say it doesn't matter? Cuz maybe they think that they will be able to help, like introduce them to the Holy Spirit and convert them after marriage. Now that they can see the Holy Spirit play a bigger role in their life. Okay. Did you guys hear that? that? That you can introduce the Holy Spirit or introduce Christianity or introduce God in their life after marriage. Yeah. To add to what Helen said, they can be the source of why they're getting closer to God. They can bring that light. Mm -hmm. them. Like, yes, you don't have to be a Christian. Yes, you don't have to be lovey-dovey with God. No, you don't have to do that. But you can be the source of why someone might be a non-believer, but you change that so they can become a believer. Gotcha. What do you guys think about that? Okay, let's go. Let's go to uh, Mina first, and then we'll go to what Helen said. Marianne, you have a response to Helen. Okay, good. So I wanted to add something about his point. About his point that they don't yeah. care. No, no, about his point, which is becoming one flesh. Oh yes. So when they become one flesh, we still are only like we're a branch of Christ's body, and we are all sharing that. Yeah. And then there is a verse, John fifteen, uh, verse two. It says, "Every branch in me that does not." bear fruit he takes away so if if i'm gonna marry someone who's not christian and then even if i try to bring them to christianity but they don't care then they're not bearing fruit so so that i mean yeah they're not bearing fruit so it should be taken away so it, it's useless in the part of, of branch of uh, jesus so uh that's my point yeah okay but uh no 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 that that, that makes sense that makes sense uh marianne are we talking about like marriage, like marrying an unbeliever, or maybe like can like 
meeting somebody who isn't a you know believer and then converting them and then getting married. Which one are we talking about? We're talking about marrying a non-believer. So we never even try to convert them? We just get married and then we try to convert them after marriage? M- what, being married to a non-believer or, or being in a relationship with a non-believer and, and wanting to marry a non-believer. Um, of course, it would be great if they can be converted before, but, but if the intention walking into a relationship with a non-believer, how does that, where does that put us? I think that that's fine because, you know, as long as we have the intention of converting them before marriage, that's okay. Because, you know, God didn't forbid us from, you know, marrying, you know, Gentiles back then where the Jews were very strict and they can only marry, you know, Jews, you know, back in the Old Testament. Well, now we're in the New Testament Mm -hmm. where it's not just limited to one race or one, you know, you know what I mean? So... But we're talking about faith. Or one... Like, God opened it up to everybody to convert. And so we should be open to, you know, allowing others into the faith who, for us, maybe are not Egyptian. Okay. So, but but still have the intention of converting them to the faith okay. eventually before marriage. And if they didn't want to convert? Then we end the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's then red, it's done. <laughs> red X. <laughs> okay. Yes, Helen. You... want to put yourself in that position or situation right. you know but if he's like who's god like okay i want to know more then i think that they could be like hey like let me teach you more like you know and they can be again the source <clears throat> is it advisable to date and marry a non-christian because don't I? date So the reason I say this is because there's a verse that's up on the screen by 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 that says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbeliever. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? So when we take this verse into consideration, we want to know what that's, what that's talking about. Yeah, go ahead. I think that's just because they were so new to the faith that, you know, St. Paul didn't want them to lose that faith Mm -hmm. by bad influence. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he also says that what about couples who were already married before Christianity was preached to them? And let's say maybe the wife believed, but the husband didn't. He doesn't tell them go get divorced and separate because one is a believer, one isn't. He says pray for them and continue the marriage because that's more important. Right, but before, so now, now, now we're not already married. So those of us who are looking for marriage and happen to find ourselves in relationship with non-believers, what, what, what is the, what is the response? Or what is the advice for that? Anybody? If they're not willing to convert, you just leave them. <laughs> I think uh, just I wanted to add something. Yeah. Um, I think if you're going to a person in the intention of changing them just so that you can end up getting married to them, I think the whole process is wrong. Like, if you're thinking that way, oh, I'm going to marry them, and then, like, God willing, I'll be able to uh, help them change or convert. Well, they're, they're saying before. They're right, saying. right. Well, I'm saying, like, essentially, you should, like, if that's a person that you care about their salvation, your first thought shouldn't be, like, oh, like, I, like let's say that's a person that you know you have marriage and intention for but the thing is like you should be thinking of how can God save them before how I can marry them and then or like how I could change them and then marry them like Mm -hmm. either way you're thinking of marriage the intention is marriage and intention is not God's salvation for them so I think first you should have the intention that God should save them Mm -hmm. and the intention Mm -hmm. that if they choose God you know Obviously, they have to make a choice. You can't force them. But if they choose God, then you can start thinking about right. that. But in, in the light of reaching God. Right. You can't think of the other way around. So, so to wrap this up, does anybody have any final thoughts? Any final thoughts? Huh? Yes, Helen, go ahead. I think it goes back to the person who is dating, who is getting married. Like, like it matters, do they care about the faith? Do they want to continue the faith? 
is it something that they want in their life ever after? And if so, then they need to make it prominent in their relationship early on to see if this person will want to be part of the faith. Yeah, so, so um, there's definitely a lot of thoughts about that. But so when we talk about everybody has the Holy Spirit, so everybody has the Holy Spirit who is not Christian for the sake of wanting them to come to believe in God. So God moves certain people's hearts towards him in order for them to change their faith and become, uh, to come to know God essentially. And that happens through the change of heart that the Holy Spirit allows in certain people's lives. But those of us who are Christian uh, because of our baptism, the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us calls us to become closer to God uh, day in and day out. And so in marriage, where we sort of, because marriage is a way of salvation. Marriage is a way of salvation just like monasticism is a way of salvation. Marriage is also a, a direct path to, to salvation. And so because that's the case, a man and a woman are expected to meet one another at the feet of Christ. They're expected to meet one another with that same um, level of humility in knowing that God is, 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 the, uh, is the third entity of their Trinitarian marriage, essentially. And so when we meet people that are potential um, uh, yeah, I mean, applicants for our lifelong relationships or, you know, potential uh, spouse or mate, we want to meet those people at the feet of Christ because this is what creates the first level of compatibility, which is spiritual and faith-based compatibility. And then based on that compatibility, every other layer and every other layer is different for us, right? Some people value culture or race or education or whatever or morals or whatever. These are all secondary sort of um, foundations that we can talk about from more of like a marriage perspective. But from a faith-based or from a, from, a, from a church perspective, there has to be that very foundational compatibility, which is essentially that we both meet each other at the feet of Christ. And once that's established, everything else is secondary. Everything else is, is above that. You know, education, level, culture, race, uh, you, you, you name it. That's all secondary. And we can talk about what are those challenges, you know, from, from in a different, different talk. But for the sake of this burning question, uh, it, it is extremely important, extremely important that the intention of this marriage is it's leading me to salvation. So how will this partner that I'm potentially choosing going to lead me to this way? Because otherwise we'd be taking risks. We'd be taking risks on our salvation and on theirs, honestly, right? So, and, and I'm not so sure, but that's not a risk that, 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 that many of us should be willing to take because, because it's our eternal life. And so marriage in itself has a lot of cha challenges and difficulties to add the foundational requirement as a difficulty or a challenge in of itself makes the road so much harder, in, 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 in my opinion, and what I've kind of uh, read based on this. Do you want to add anything about this? You sure? Nothing? Anybody have any final thoughts about this? Yeah, so, no, thank you for guys for taking the time to discuss this. I know it's kind of a um, um, different kind of a topic, but I think it's important to discuss those things because there are things that kind of come and, and, and get our, our minds busy. And like Nader was saying, like, like we have desires, and those desires are real. And when those desires hit, we can become really stubborn. I mean, how many times have you had, you yourself or friends that you've had, you've become extremely stubborn because of certain desires. And so when you, when you want something, this is what I want, I'm gonna do it no matter what, and you're not willing to listen to any consultations or any advice or anything like that. Why? Because there is a raging desire or crave to do that one thing in my mind and my mind only. And that can cause like, like destructive consequences, right? So 
Um, let's just be kind of aware of that. Um, not that that's never a, um, like, never a possible way. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the stats are. But I wouldn't say that's, that it's the advisable way, you know, to, uh, to, to date or, inter or, or marry for the purposes of, like, missionary marriage, right? To convert. Like, we're converting in order to get, you know, because, because we, it's just, it's high risks. High risks. That's how I look at it. What do you guys think? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and end. And In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord God, amen. We thank you, your compassionate Lord.